Hello and welcome to the 13th Arts Talk in this digital online series. I'm delighted to be in, uh, introducing Duncan Werner, who's kindly going to be talking to us about his research that he's been doing at the University of Derby within the Digital Material Artistic Research Centre, which is at the School of Arts. Um, DMARC, as we call it, is home to the artistic research and dissemination of practice exhibitions and published texts from across the disciplines of performing arts, music, media, art and design. And DMARC's focus is really on increasing understanding of the shifting boundaries and new relationships within artistic research, practice and theory, um, and how the researchers are exploring the potential of hybrid forms made possible by both digitization and traditional art forms, and also the social agendas of inclusive living and creative agency. So Duncan is going to be um, talking with us today. A little bit of background about Duncan. He graduated from Aston University in electrical electronic engineering in the late 70s. He's also a keen musician who moved towards the music industry, gaining work as a recording and touring musician in the UK and Europe, and was employed by the London-based Chrysalis Music Group as studio sound engineer for a number of years. Um, he then followed this up by uh, postgraduate music technology studies at City University in London, and his research interests include immersive music production, in particular the gas systems, which uh, Duncan's going to be talking to us more about shortly, um, which has been uh, undertaken and is based at the University of Derby. So alongside that, he's also been the programme leader for BSC in Music Technology since its inception in 1995, and he's also currently programme leader for the MA Music Production degree. So Duncan, welcome. Um, and without, uh, I'm very excited to hear more about your, uh, your research. Um, and I'll hand over to you. Okay, well, um, welcome to my presentation uh, on GASP. Um, it's a project we've been involved with for um, a, a few years now. Um, GASP is Guitars with Ambisonic Spatial Performance. Um, and on that front slide, you can see three names, myself, Bruce Wiggins and Emma Fitzmorris. Um, we've all made contributions in different ways. Um, and we'll, we'll, uh, I'll explain a little bit more about that as we go through the slides. So it's a University of Derby Cross College collaboration between myself and Bruce Wiggins in engineering um, and another an alternative title um, could be the design and development and application of an ambisonic guitar system so aka GASP just gives it a little bit more context so what is GASP it's two things um, it's an innovative audio project that fuses the musical with the technical, combining individual string timbralization with ambisonic immersive sound. So this first definition is, is, is sort of down the technical route in, in terms of creating um, an ambisonic guitar system. Um, and then the other definition we've got for it is that it's an artistic musical project. So it's having, having created what you might call a new breed of musical instrument, it's the application of that. Um, where can that go musically um, and potentially commercially? Um, so that they are the kind of two interactive areas and one feeds into the other. Um, as, we, as we realize we need to try uh, achieve certain other things, then that leads us back to how do we do that? So we might need to create some new bits of software or kit or whatever to make it happen. So the GASP applications include um, a live performance as an immersive 
spatial sound instrument, either as a solo or part of an ensemble. This could be a small theatre or a large concert space. Um, secondly, in terms of the web and virtual reality applications, there are ways in which we can translate the audio such that it can be replayed over headphones with uh, systems such as YouTube and Facebook 360, which, which uh, embed 360 um, visual imagery and visual uh, and auditory uh, information. Um, additionally, there is the uh, virtual reality applications, which are a, a, another area that we, we hope to uh, look into. Guitar performance and analysis tuition. One of the offshoots of the system is that it will allow a visual display of certain performance artifacts um, and that can provide uh, feedback to the player um, for, for sort of identifying where mistakes might be missed, uh, made or, or where performance can be improved. And, and last but not least, um, a research tool for performative applications um, with significant potential for the use in the sound arts world. Um, again, this is um, something that we want to move into. Um, we haven't explored it in much depth, but there is significant potential for that with the, um, with the surround nature of the instrument. So in order to kind of understand a little bit about GASP, so GASP being guitars with ambisonic spatial performance, I think it's useful to just have a bit of an oversight of what ambisonics is. So ambisonics is a, set, is a system for recording and playback um, to capture 360 degrees of the sound. So rather than uh, point a microphone at something and pick that one dimension location up, Ambisonics seeks to deal with the full surround nature of perception, of sound perception. Um, it can be played back over a series of circular loudspeaker systems. Um, in our case, we normally play back over an, an eight loudspeaker circular system. However, um, with the web getting involved with surround sound, they have embraced ambisonics as a format and now um, embed that into YouTube and Facebook. But instead of using loudspeakers, they use headphones. So they're using some very sophisticated sound processing to convert um, surround sound information over headphones. So instead of just hearing information from left and right, you're hearing information from front and back as well. So the GASP project seeks to exploit ambisonics for a new purpose. That is the guitar as a spatial audio or immersive musical instrument. So we can reproduce this, uh, the, the, the GASP system over either loudspeakers or headphones. So we recently um, set up a, a web page for GASP that was with the funding from the on-campus internship scheme at the university. Um, and there's a, there's a, um, <clears throat> a banner there that with, our, with a screenshot of our web page. Um, the reason I've included that is just to, is just to say on our web page, there's, there's information about how the project's developed, there are posters that have been created by individual and groups of students that have worked on it. There are examples of academic papers and presentations that we've made. There are links to um, Facebook and YouTube where you can hear examples of our work. Um, and there's a subheading of GASP, which is Immersive Audio Production Research for Guitars with Hexaphonic Pickups. This is significant because we now introduce the term hexaphonic pickups. So what are hexaphonic pickups? Well, normally a guitar, an electric guitar, 
would normally output a mono signal, a monophonic signal. And you would plug that into an amplifier and, uh, and there you go. However, hexaphonic pickups allow the guitar to output individual sound signals from each individual string. So for a guitar with six strings, which is the normal guitar, you would have six individual outputs. So this then facilitates an individual processing for each individual string. So given that we can access each individual string, we can start to do interesting things with the ways in which that's processed. Two of those things are called timbralization and spatialization. The, the hexaphonic pickup um, is a fairly recent, um, something that's been made available fairly recently for guitarists. Um, it's only available as an add-on and only available from certain uh, places that we've been able to find out in the States. The example that's shown here is from a company called PsychFi and you can see, I'm not sure if my mouse will come into the picture here, but you can see the individual modules and each one of those modules sits underneath a given string so that that individual string is picked up and processed individually. We've got one of these PsychFi pickups attached to one of our Gasper guitars and you can see in the picture here this is our uh, multi-channel pickup, our hexaphonic pickup, uh, fitted to this particular guitar. They're modular, which means that you can have them for six-string guitars, seven-string guitars, eight-string guitars, etc. Um, so in that sense, <clears throat> that, that sort of gives flexibility for uh, future proofing. Um, we've also got another couple of guitars with earlier versions of hexaphonic pickups. One is a Yamaha acoustic and one is another Fender Stratocaster. These were pickups from a company uh, called Ubitar, again in the States. Uh, this was more um, bespoke um, and these guys will design them specifically for your own instrument. So defining terms, we've used the word tambralization. What do we mean by that? Um, well, timbralization is essentially the sound of an instrument. Um, so if I were to give you an example of, say, the difference between a violin and a trumpet, both playing the same note in the same key, clearly we'd recognise the difference in timbre. The difference in timbre being the harmonic content of the sound, that is the essence of the sound itself. So we can clearly distinguish those two sounds. What we do with timbralization is we use the raw guitar sound as the um, initial impetus, and then we re that with alternative uh, timbres. And we do that timbralization with a program called Helix Native. So this is a piece of software, it's commercial software, um, and it's designed for guitars, but it's designed for guitars that you would normally use for a single output. So uh, typically a guitarist might buy the um, Helix pro, uh, program, plug, it, plug the guitar into the computer and achieve a wide range of different timbres from that instrument. In the case of GASP, we implement six Helix programs uh, simultaneously. That, so we've got one uh, helix timbralizer per string. So that gives us quite a lot of flexibility. Helix is a stereo sound processor. What that means is it takes in a mono input, that is a single string, and outputs a stereo output from that string. So the stereo output is two channels um, where one channel varies slightly from the other to give, uh, again, variations in timbre on the two sides of the sound. Um, the next stage, which I'll move to in a minute, is called spatialization. Um, before I do, just look at the Helix timbralizer. Um, there's a screenshot there of um, the interface for 
uh, a tambralizer. Um, and it's got hundreds of presets and lots of ways in which guitarists like to readjust the sound of their instrument, including lots of different amplifiers and, and pedals that do things like phasing and flanging and chorusing. Um, these are the kind of stock tools of guitarists. So just to be, just to reiterate, we're using six uh, Helix tambalizers, one on each guitar string. So that takes us to the point where we might want to consider what do we mean by spatialization? Well, spatialization is the key to the immersive sound of the gas project. We achieve spe spatialization using um, bespoke software called Wigware. Wigware is um, ambisonic decoding software that's written by my colleague Bruce Wiggins. Um, and this software was written for the gas project. So what we have is we have six individual Wigware spatializers receiving the output of six individual helix tambralizers from each individual string of the guitar. That means each string can now be processed both timbrally and spatially independently. In terms of the spatializers, then we've got some parameters that we work with. And these are known as spread, angle and distance. Okay, so with respect to um, spatialization, we have three parameters that we can work with. Spread, angle and distance. It's important to recognize what these are doing because these are the key uh, spatializing elements behind the gas system. So spread is taking in um, a stereo output from the helix tambralizer. So it's taking in two channels of information. So if I use my mouse here, I hope that, that will show. So what we have here is essentially this, this, this circle here is the representation of the room or the space in which we are listening. So we are the listener in the middle of the room. That's the front of the room, that's the back. So around the periphery of the room would be typically in our case, eight loudspeakers. So there might be one in front, one behind, left, right, and in the other corners as well. So we've got eight loud, eight loudspeakers surrounding us. And <clears throat> what's happening here is with the spread control, it's taking the stereo output from the tambralizer and spreading that around the room um, as two separate signals. So we've got um, a dynamic stereo image that is um, available to be listened to at different points in the room. Now you can see that on here we've got movement of the left and right image. This is moving at a, a specific rate, i.e. speed, but we've got control over that. We can make this room faster or slower. We can slow it right down until it's barely noticeable, or we can speed it up until it's effectively untrackable. So the, it beco then becomes an effect rather than something that the ear can actually track and recognize where it is. So just trying to find the mouse again. So what's happening is here, this, this is the center point of the stereo image and the stereo image is, is moving around it. However, if we move on to the angle control, the center of that stereo image, now what we've got here with the angle control is almost a mono image where the two stereo images are quite close together. And that happens to be moving around the room at a certain rate. Um, we again can have control over the speed of that rotation and we can move it clockwise or anti-clockwise. And this is where your imagination needs to come in because if you can imagine the combination of the spread function and the angle function such that the spread is being separated around the center point of the image 
but the center point of the image is actually moving. So we get into quite complex arrangements of how the audio is being sent to different points in the, um, in the room. So just to mention that, that the ambisonic system is actually reproducing this, these sound sources at these locations. It's not sending it from speaker to speaker because ambisonics works uh, on the basis that it moves the sound gradually from one loudspeaker to the next. It's not shifting it in a stepwise fashion. And then the last parameter is what we call distance parameter. And again, this is receiving two channels of stereo signal from one guitar string. And it's, um, it, it's taking that in and it's changing the um, spatial features of the stereo image itself. So when the puck, when the white puck is towards the edge, we get the single, I'll wait for it to go back, we get the single blue and red. When it moves to the center, you can see that the blue and red envelop throughout the whole of the room image. So again, that's another um, spatial parameter that we can adjust to enhance the sort of immersive quality of the spatial sound. So, there's some text here that allows us to um, sort of scrutinize that. I won't talk through that because that was really the text that I've used on the previous slide. So I shall move on from there. Um, what this is doing is showing some examples in the way in which um, each individual string has got um, spatialization applied to it. So for instance, on the left of the screen, we've got six uh, spatializers, one for each string of the guitar, and each string is being spatialized in a different way. So that the whole sort of immersiveness of it becomes, well, certainly becomes visually apparent, and it is in reality uh, audibly apparent. Um, so this is one where we've got an example of the distance control being manipulated. This is one where we've got the angle control being manipulated with what you might call a fixed stereo image. And notice that the um, relative position of the center of the stereo image on each of these strings is shifted by a certain amount. So the, the immersiveness of the sound becomes more apparent. It's not, as it, it's, it's not like sending the whole of the guitar signal around the room, we're splitting the guitar signal up and we are reconstituting that uh, through the spatial areas. We need a way to control the system and the control is done through a separate computer called, um, well the program that we run on it is called Ableton Live. So Ableton Live is um, another music program um, what we've got here are a range of presets that we've created. So if you can see in here, we've got something called spatializer presets and we've got something called timbralizer presets. So we've created around, I think around 20 different spatializer presets. These are different ways in which we can orient the different um, spatializers such that they achieve a different spatial effect. So examples, I'm just reading randomly here, could be um, pseudo mono stepped or static circle wide or rotating wide, sorry, rotating circle wide alternates. Um, so these were terms that we have created that enable us to sort of give a, a name to the different spatial effects that the system will provide. And, and equally, uh, in terms of being able to select different timbres for the instrument from the Helix programs, uh, we've, we've identified around uh, 30 useful presets. So these, um, these presets and, and controls 
are accessed through something called MIDI. Um, as most musicians will know, MIDI is Musical Instrument Digital Interface. Um, and that allows um, communication of musical parameters between instruments and computers. Um, this next slide just shows a little bit of how that is working. So you can see um, the right hand side of the screen and, and here we've got some, some shapes that are representative of spatial movement. So the, the, uh, the value of the slope on these uh, shapes as the, as the cursor moves through them. So this is, a, this is moving through time. So this information is related to the spatial areas. So it's a way in which we can easily control the tempo of the spatializers and by selecting um, the uh, controls for presets, we can get um, different spatializing and timbralizing effects. So the guitar pegiator is something that, that came out of the um, system design as we were using hexaphonic pickups. Um, as, you would not, as you would not normally be able to access the individual strings on a standard guitar, because we can access the individual strings, we can do interesting things um, with them in terms of, um, well, the phrase is to punch holes in the sound. So instead of when you, pluck a guitar string, instead of that being a continuous sound, you can punch holes in that, such that the guitar string itself becomes something that has a, a rhythmic, rhythmic component to it. So the note can be on or off and on or off in a rhythmic fashion. Now, if you can imagine that occurring on six strings and then that being programmable, so that you can define where the the holes in the notes are, then we end up with something that's a little bit like a MIDI arpeggiator. So most keyboards and synthesizers will have what's called an, an arpeggiator built into them. Um, and ar arpeggiation is, is when you um, glide through different notes, but just for a very short period of time, such that you create a sort of um, what you might call a rainbow effect as you move through the notes as they switch between them. And what we've got here is um, a set of notes that are triggered by a sequencer such that we can program these notes that switch on and off as the player plays. So it's an enhanced feature, if you like. We did once call it the rhythmatizer, but thought the guitar pegiator was more um, apt. So as an overview of the system, we've then got an input from the guitar into the interface and computer. The computer is running Helix software for timbralization, it's running gating software to achieve the arpeggiation, and it's running wigware to achieve the spatialization. Um, that is then sent to the output, which distributes it to either a set of loudspeakers or to the headphone systems in, in Facebook or YouTube. There's a pedal board to allow the selection of some of those uh, presets running through the program called Ableton, which is the controlling features for the um, gate, uh, the Helix gate, spatializer, etc. So, a schematic diagram that we included, I won't spend a lot of time on this, but this was included so that to show that it's actually a complex system. We have two computers there, we have interfaces, we have lots of loudspeakers. We have lots of wires doing lots of sending different types of signals across the computer systems. So this was done as an aid for us when we, when we take it to pieces and, and reconstitute it elsewhere. Um, but you can see that effectively these are our set of external loudspeakers and the listener or the audience would be in the middle. Now that clearly from this diagram doesn't look like there's much space for an audience but this this set of loudspeakers could be in a, a small studio space or it could be in a large theatre. 
So the musician could be, or the musicians could be to one side and the audience will be in the sort of uh, sweet spots uh, in the center of the loudspeaker system. In terms of a picture of the hardware, that was um, something that we, we created just to show uh, the extent of the hardware, etc. So this is our L Ableton controller software. This is uh, the, the Reaper program, which is running the Helix timbralizers, the spatializers, and the guitar pagiator, and a separate monitor showing the individual um, spatializers for the individual strings. We've had some feedback. We, as a college, have visits from um, uh, external accreditors for our courses, and we gave a demonstration to David Ward, who's the director of James, which is Joint Online Media Educational Support. Um, <clears throat> David uh, kindly gave us some feedback, um, which was pleasing. Uh, I guess what to pull out of this is that the, the project um, includes a myriad of commercial, theatrical, performance and educational potentials. That was pleasing to note. Um, we also sought some um, intellectual property feedback and um, was in contact with Prospect IP, which is a company used by the university. Um, I guess what we can pull out of this is that um, key information was that we should, we're advised to explore deriving impact and reputational enhancement, uh, including copyright, know-how, trademarks and designs. Um, uh, and uh, the, 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 the impact potential and also the potential commercial uh, possibilities. Um, so this was associated with, with investigating um, how the music industry or how the VR sector, virtual reality sector, might receive our work. Prior to lockdown, we made some contacts with the famous Abbey Road Studios. Um, Abbey Road now have their own research and development section. Uh, we had a Zoom meeting with them in February um, and it was agreed that they were going to come to Derby to visit us. Um, clearly that didn't happen, um, so we're looking to reschedule that at some point. We, we also uh, made a band called Mirror Shot aware of what we were doing. They're a, what you might call a new wave virtual reality band. Um, their guitarist was interested and, and we again did arrange a visit, but that had to be rescheduled. Um, past, present and future, we've done presentations at University of Hamburg, June 2017. We did a presentation in Derby at Sounds in Space, that's the University Symposium, June 2019. In last December, we went to um, University of West London, presented to a conference called Innovation in Music. Our paper is to be included in a chapter, which is um, due to be published by Routledge. As a result of that, we, we have invitation to um, a conference at the University of Lisbon called the 21st Century Guitar. And um, we also have an interest from Berklee College of Music, Valencia, who would like to use the GASP system as part of their end of year uh, concert um, show. Some examples of our work is available on our web page. These are tracks, guitar parts from songs that some students have created and some of our guitar teachers have created. Um, we have then done the GASP production on them and they can be heard at a link from our GASP project page uh, on, on Facebook. We've been funded kindly by a number of areas of the university. 
I won't run through them, but you can see them all there. And clearly we are very grateful for that funding to take us to the point where we are today. There are some links there, communications and references of um, products and uh, softwares that we have used in our project. For future work, um, we, we, we were looking towards um, a PhD studentship to enable our system to be further developed. The areas for further development include the rationalization. That is to say, we really need to put all of this technology into one box um, so that it's an accessible and user-friendly system. Um, it's currently two-dimensional, that is to be, to be heard over a, a series of um, circular loudspeakers. However, true ambisonics represents height information. So a 3D representation would be um, a useful thing to take this project to in the next stages. And, and what, what's referred to as an enhanced binaural representation. This is the, the headphone feed using the, the psychoacoustic um, phenomena that is employed in Facebook and, and YouTube to represent surround sound over headphones. The last slide is a picture of our uh, still of our one of our presentations that we did. This was uh, the university's Sounds in Space last June uh, and at the end of the day after a series of presentations uh, we took over one of the spaces, set it all up with the GASP system, invited some interested parties uh, where we had a session musician and invited other musicians to come along to try it out and generally have a conversation about how it worked. So thanks for listening. That's the end of my presentation. I was really uh, interested in what you were saying about the idea of a 21st century guitar um, and thinking about uh, it as a, you know, as, as a, a changeable, creative uh, instrument that's um, been really furthered by the technology that you're using but also that you're designing as well um, and I really like how you describe it very much as it's through the practice so it's actually through the making of music that you're trying these technologies out um, rather than creating the technology first so that was really interesting and I guess also given that in your biography you talk about um, your time working in a sound studio so very much from position of a practitioner coming come to then uh, teaching and, and researching thereafter. I wonder if you could maybe um, reflect a little bit for those listening and, and thinking about studying music um, how for you that kind of journey of working in industry first and coming into academia do you think that's shaped the way that you now approach music? Um, it, it absolutely has um, I guess <clears throat> the processes that I went through as a as a fledgling sound engineer uh, were not through um, an education, self-taught, if you like, mm. through interest. Um, so, so I made lots of mistakes um, and learned from them. Um, so I guess from the perspective of, of being able to sort of pass, pass that information on to students, um, uh, it's interesting that we can, we can you know, we can put students in a lecture theatre, we can put students in a, in a recording studio, but until they start to make their own mistakes, um, then that's where the real learning starts. Hopefully the mistakes that they're making are more sophisticated mistakes than I was making. So if you like, the, the level of, of where they're at um, 
is is you know it's not it's not coming from a, a a low level hopefully we will have embedded all the basic skills such that the mistakes they make will be ones where they have tried to be creative or have very successfully been creative and then recognized some flaws in that or you know ways in which that could be enhanced etc so so yes um coming from a practitioner background into education um has has been very helpful to me i think as a as a as a teacher as a university tutor um in in knowing what it feels like mm. to, to to not know very much about a system or a, a process mm -hmm. and th therefore have some sense of, of how that might be approached mm. Mm. Yeah, the, the, the other thing I wanted to pick up on was your use of language. Um, I read there were a couple of things I jotted down where you you mentioned and described the how it was punching holes um, or the rainbow effect. And I really liked the way that you used uh, language to conjure up um, that that visualization that you you know in order to then allow an, someone like me who's not a specialist in this field at all to have a sense of what that uh spatial effect technology and how that works um mm -hmm. through the lang the accessibility of the language and the visualization of of it and i wonder whether thinking about that kind of learning that that students have that the importance of those visualizations to see how those levels work or those ideas of punching holes and rainbow effect, that those descriptions enable you to, to grasp or to, to, you were talking about uh, the immersive quality of the spatializations to really come to the fore because you're kind of imagining scenes as well as hearing them does that does that <laughs> i don't know if i yeah, no, it's, it's, that it's, a very, it's, it's a very valid point and and i remember through this process having a conversation with with emma who uh, worked with us in the um in the uh, sort of spatialization area when we we're setting the system up and and in order for me to express what i was wanting to uh, hear um, I was, you know, we, we, one of the conversations we, we, we had was, well, what the hell are we talking about um, in terms of the words to use to oh. describe the sound that we want to communicate? Um, so a, a lexicon of spatial sound is actually something that needs to be done. Now, I'm sure somebody <laughs> will send me an email and say, hey, I saw your <laughs> last talk and here's this lexicon. <laughs> that would be great. But um, um, so, yeah, you're absolutely right that, that getting the kind of words to match the sounds or max, match the, um, the, the images, the, the spatial images and the timbral images that we are using can be a challenge. Um, so, so it's a, a point well taken, and, and it, it's a it's a rife area for further research. Yeah, but it also allows um, uh, it to be more accessible, especially for people who may have hearing impair impairments. That you're allowing music to become more accessible as well through through the play of language. Um, right. And it also make, made me think about um, Gwen Heaney, who um, uh, writes about rupturing soundscapes and the space uh, in between what she describes as the material memory. And I really like that because, you know, you've got very much its kit and its equipment, equipment and its wiring, but it's also an, about sound and imagery and imagination and those kind of 360 experience and it mm. it's kind of made me um reinterpret that idea of a material memory in a very different way having now listened to your um practice um 
I wonder where you um, mentioned uh, that there were sort of three main areas in space in the spatial parameters that you talked about the spread the angle and the distance I wonder if um, if someone were to say to you okay what's the fourth what would the fourth <laughs> be <laughs> yeah yeah that's interesting could there be you know yeah. um, is there a limit to that potential or you know <laughs> yeah I, th I, th I think okay there might be. I, I don't know what it is, um, and it's and it's worth thinking about. I guess what we were what we were really seeking to do was 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 once we've identified those three variables, to combine them in different ways. So if you if you kind of think about just the the number of um, let, okay, for instance, um, let's say we've got twenty spatializer presets, and if we've got thirty um, variations on timbre just the, the multiplication of those two numbers yeah. um, gives you sort of a physical quantity of the the amount of sort of effects that the guitar uh the, the the gasp system will 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 create but but taking your i mean the analogy that i got from the first thing that popped into my head was um and i guess this analogy kind of holds was um, you're talking about three dimensions? Well, the sort of three dimensions in space. So the sort of um, x, y, z on a mathematical plane, um, and the fourth dimension would be time. So something that would that would exist throughout and and pro and and change through time. But actually, because we can modify our spatializers through time, we can modulate them then that fourth dimension is already to an extent kind of built in. Um, but, but yes, it's a very interesting kind of analogy that you, you raise. Um, yeah, yeah. I mean, it just got me thinking as, um, you know, from, I guess, from an artist's point of view, you're talking about its potential use within the kind of performative um, uh, realm as well and it made me think about you know some of the kind of um sonic artists that are starting to think about the use of sound in space and landscapes and uh the notions of present past and future that come through in some of those writings on on soundscaping and i just think there's some really interesting um experiments that i have done you know if you were to take your technology and situate uh, that conversation um, in a completely different environment outside of uh, a theatre space, outside of the research lab and take it into uh, a completely different public location, how that would, have, would interact with the landscape it's situated in. Um, it made me think back to the slide you showed with the position of the eight speakers um, and how you would position those differently or do the audience always need to be in the middle you know or it was, yeah it was really interesting to, to see not <clears throat> I guess I guess if I guess if you were yeah I guess if you were um, if you if you if you if you're coming from the kind of purist approach for ambisonics then the whole point is to create that sense of surrender and distance and um, um, equal angles, if you like, between the loudspeakers. But that doesn't mean to say that from an artistic point of view, you can't experiment with that, of oh. course. And, and, and there could be all sorts of possibilities. And, and that's, that was the fourth point on the applications slide which was, you know, applications within sound arts. Mm. So we've only just begun to scratch the surface with what the, or with, with how the gas system could be used within a, a, a performative context um, for guitarists, um, you, you, you know, using non-standard sounds. So, um, you know, in interesting sounds that don't sound like guitar at all. 
So mm. you're just merely then using the guitar as a controller instrument. Mm. And the sound and the spatialness itself is an entirely different mm. you know, element. Yeah, I wrote down here um, when you were when you were talking at the start about the hexaphonic pickup being six, seven, or eight um, components long, um, and I I kind of wrote, what's the maximum it could be? You know, <laughs> like how you know, like with then all of these things, but. Um, yeah. yeah, and I said it's like its own orchestra is being created. Yeah. Exactly. Um, exactly. It is, um, because it can be used independently. So, um, so yeah, I, entirely. In terms of that technology for the hexaphonic pickup, um, I mean, there are, there are such instruments as seven string, string and nine string guitars. Um, and this particular company do do manufacture them for specialist applications. Um, interestingly, I had a conversation with someone at a conference who said, "Well, where where else could it go? Could you could we have a an ambisonic harp, <laughs> so, yeah. so that you would have a series of pickups on each individual harp string um, to create an immersive harp sound, for instance?" So. In, in theory, you could. In practice, uh, yeah, it could, it could be done, but it'd be a, a fair bit of work. Mm. Um, but um, that would be, you know, a kind of mind-boggling spatial instrument. Yeah, but I, I like that idea of it, that each string has almost like its own mind, you know, its own kind of individual complexities become possible. Uh, like members of an orchestra that they're all kind of independent uh, and a sense of thinking back to what I guess my first question was um, around the comment that you made about that idea I guess of the potential for uh, what a 21st century guitar could be um, if you're thinking mm. about the different technologies that you're engaging with and not only have you got them created and being used in a really original way, but it's also the scope for the future research and the future possibilities is endless as well, which is really exciting. <laughs> Thank you, Duncan. Thank you ever so much. It's been really enlightening and uh, fascinating to hear, hear your talk. And I'm very excited to, to watch as your research progresses and to see um, what the future holds uh, for this really exciting um, field of research. So thank you once again. Yeah, thank you very much.